All right, everyone. Welcome back. Same Brain Podcast, episode five. Uh, today, we are lucky enough to have a special guest. I have with me Professor McGrath. Uh, quick introduction for Professor. She went to Mount St. Mary's College. She double majored in philosophy and political economy. She received her master's degree and doctorate in philosophy from the Catholic University of America. Uh, she's one of the most loved professors here at Assumption. Um, I have her th for one of my classes this semester. I can say with confidence that she's consistent. She's fair. She's most importantly honest with her students. I think her, uh, her lectures are compelling. I think her sidebars relate to students and they're engaging. Um, her explanations are in-depth, sometimes too in-depth. <laughs> Um, but to reiterate, uh, Professor McGrath is donate, donating her time uh, today, and for that we're very grateful. So thank you, Professor. Is that all fair? Sure. All correct? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Um, and I will say that this podcast um, is not affiliated with Assumption, and the things that Professor McGrath says today are, are not attached to her teaching roles at the university. Um, <clears throat> I guess before we get into it, I'll ask you one Lame question. Are you ready for Easter break? When's Thursday? Uh, yeah, I guess. I'm taking my kids to New York for two days. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I got tickets to a play. I'm looking forward to that. But I haven't nice. packed. I haven't planned the train ride. I, there's okay. a lot of things for me to do to make sure that that trip goes well. Is that Friday, Saturday? or Thursday, Friday. Good. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> well, um, so we only have so much time, and I want to talk about a bunch of things. I think I'll start by providing you know, either a question or an opinion, and I think you can respond and that'll be an effective way to carry out some of these ideas. <clears throat> um, one of the broad topics I want to talk about is education at, at um, kind of a bird's eye view and higher education in general. Um, kind of some, we'll start with maybe some negative things, I, I opinions I have, and then we can talk about some, some positive things because no doubtably higher education is uh, one of the most important things in our society. Um, to start, like the first thing I'll say, I think that uh, my my first negative thing that I've noticed in my second year at college, I'd say that I worry sometimes about too much uh, positive attitudes, and I sound <laughs> kind of weird saying that, but even when something negative has to be said, it might be looked down upon simply because others view it as negative, um, and I, I don't like that. Number two, uh, this cancel culture, I think I think it's real. I see it sometimes, sometimes, but I feel it, it's pressures. And um, I guess to describe the problem specifically, I'd say that to me it seems like one person is gatekeeping knowledge they don't necessarily have, and that's justified by the fact that their opinion is more morally good, it's sound, um, and that ones that are contrary to it, the, the problem is that they believe those opinions are evil, and that's probably at its worst, I'd say. Um, so yeah, what do you think about those kind of broad assessments? Well, let me start with a second. Um, I mean, cancel culture, I think, definitely does happen. I also think it can be overblown. So people want to um, act like victims and therefore assert a kind of cancel culture because they're vulnerable. People aren't allowed to say things, and then if someone says something they disagree with, they can get canceled. But the other thing happens, too which is that then people act like they're victims of cancel culture and they often really overblow that and then try to make a big name for themselves. And there are national figures who do that. Um, so I think that there's some, uh, how do I put this, uh, insincerity mm. um, and some hyperbole. Right. And it's a kind of dynamic that I worry about um, because it's not dedicated to uh, thinking things through uh, but rather shutting down. True. Um, and I think that the, what you point to is that people think, oh, they have the, the morally correct view. I mean, one way to think about this is that it's just moralism, and it's not like moralism was invented in the last few years. Right, right. And specifically in America, we're a Puritan culture. I mean, that's one of the main features of our uh, the founding of our culture is Puritanism, especially here in Massachusetts. And I think we go through waves of real puritanical moralism um, of uh, enthusiasms which are intolerant of uh, evidences that we don't like. And that's not something that was invented in the last few years either. Mm, okay. So um, that's just to say is that I actually think that it's better now than it was like last year, for example. Right. Um, okay. I, I think COVID 
I felt it worse in the classroom when we were wearing masks mm -hmm. than I do now. Maybe because um, of the kind of dispute between the masks. Or... That's That was part of it. But I also just think people were in a lot of ways stressed out and not feeling well and not feeling connected to other people and they took that out in a certain way and um okay but in any case right. i think that i think that it's it's still going on to some degree and it's but it's, it's never going to completely go away and That's then right. it's going to come in waves and you're going to see it again so i think if i was 20 i'd be more alarmed than i am now i think this is cyclical mm. and um yeah and but it kind of can't go away right because if someone is saying something truly terrible then they should be shut down and they right is that kind of a problem that well, I think every culture has to draw lines about what it considers um, something that's both so irrational and so dangerous or evil that it doesn't want to talk about it anymore. We've okay. done, we're done thinking about that, and we're not going to talk about that anymore. Hmm. And all cultures draw so. those lines. They're lines about sacredness, I think, and we call that you know people who cross those lines kind of blasphemers. I don't think there are cultures that don't draw those lines. Right. I think that one of the things that we have to watch out for is we want, I want, our playing field to be really big. That is to say, um, what is the breadth uh, of reasonable disagreement that we can have? Right. And I also have lines that I would draw and say, we, you know, we have to recognize that this discussion has been had, we've come to certain conclusions, we think this is dangerous, you know, but, um, and therefore we don't need to hire this person or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, uh, so I don't think we, sh we should think that cultures can do without those lines. Like I said, this is blasphemy, and every culture has its sense of blasphemy. Uh, on the other hand, um, I want a culture that has a real broad sense of what is um, rational discussion, you know, what's open for rational discussion. And right. so one of the things that happens when these waves come, I think, is that what's open for rational discussion gets super narrow really fast, and then everyone is terrified. Yeah. And then the question is, what's really rational? Can we, what can we discuss? Right, because we, well, yeah, because my whole idea is that we can't be terrified to discuss anything. It seems like that's the discipline of, of good conversation and thoughtful um, exploration. And then to kind of feel like you may be restricted in kind of different channels, you have to stop thinking about this at that point or stop thinking about that at that point. It's, it's, a, it's a dangerous kind of thing to grow up around seems like yeah I guess what I would just say is that as a philosopher or someone who's trained philosophically mm -hmm. and probably just as someone who's weird right mm -hmm. um, I can listen to pretty much any idea that's stated as an idea right. you know not screamed at me you know sure, or sure. from another car on a highway or something like that right <laughs> yeah, in yeah. traffic um, but I can listen to it pretty much any idea like maybe the world doesn't exist and I'm like oh interesting mm -hmm. what's your evidence okay right and I'm trained to do that. I'm kind of weird. That's yeah. how we are. And so I have a really huge range of beliefs that I'm willing okay, to consider, okay. and I want to know what the evidence for them are. I think that that's one of the reasons that philosophy is often considered very dangerous is because it's, when it does that, it's not honoring the sense of blasphemy that mm -hmm. the, the culture around it usually has because cultures, most people are not trained philosophically. And so they have narrower ranges of beliefs that they're willing to consider, things that might get them angry rather than listening to evidence. I think it's unreasonable for us to consider all, you know, to think that human beings should all act like philosophers. Right. Although I do dedicate my life to hoping that I can get people to be a little bit, um, to, to broaden their sense of what's, debatable to factor philosophy a little bit into their lives in yeah. some way everyone to be less narrow I guess I would right. say yeah is philosophy dangerous oh yeah and I guess um, so it's it's kind of, it's good because it's dangerous then right because you can kind of narrow that um, you can focus on the fact that this these thoughts can go in any different way and if I if I'm aware of that then I can kind of harness that danger and use it Positively, is that fair? Yeah, but I guess I would say is that philosophy. One of the things it does is it shows us that a lot of the things that we believe, we don't actually have great reasons to believe them. Even right. when they're true beliefs, it turns right. out that we believe them when we may not even know why we believe them. Mm -hmm. And um, and then that can be very unsettling. And sometimes when that happens, it turns out that we think about the belief more and really real. We realize it's a bad belief. We should get rid of it. Rebuild our lives around different sets of beliefs. Sometimes especially young people, 
uh, they can, it can be pointed out to them that, oh, you're believing in something, you don't really have great reasons to believe it, and they can become very unstable and therefore adopt different beliefs that are actually really worse. Right. That can happen too. And so, um, you know, it's something that has to be done well and carefully by people who are really consciously oriented towards the true and the good uh, because it can be destabilizing. So you have to have a humble mind, humility, that the fact that you actually are probably wrong about every thought that you have. And that shouldn't deter you from um, practicing philosophy, but it's a way of maintaining that humble attitude. Is that so? Is humbleness the most important thing in philosophy? I think it might be the beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, and it's a virtue that has to be sustained throughout it. But that mm -hmm. isn't the only thing going on in philosophy. So it's not like Fair. you can just summarize philosophy by saying, oh, we're just going to yeah. <laughs> constantly say um, we don't know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's Is more that, like yeah. you have to maintain the attitude that um, the things that I know at any given moment, I kind of have to be ready to consider the evidence for them. Yep. Okay. And Socrates kind of, it, it sounds like the beginning. I guess, when was the beginning of philosophy? Was it Greek philosophy, would you say? Is that kind well, of I mean, the there's a kind of mythological beginning in this guy named Thales, okay. who was a couple generations uh, before Socrates, basically. Okay. Okay. And so um, Socrates is certainly a really pivotal thinker. Thales right. was more interested in what the world was made of. So famously, he thought everything was made of water. Like uh -huh. the way you think everything is made of quarks or atoms, he thought everything was made of water. So it's really the beginning of, of physics as well as philosophy. Um, and then the kind of tradition starts. Mm -hmm. uh, but, I mean, the reason we start here in um, Socrates and the Search for Truth is our intro class is because we think that that move that Socrates makes is really crucially important. It's less important for you to know whether everything is made of water or earth or mm -hmm. fire or whatever the other pre-Socratic philosophers, we call them, thought that everything was made out of. It's less important for you to figure that out mm -hmm. than it is for you to make the Socratic move and recognize that there are lots of things you don't know and that when you don't know it, you have to be willing to say, I don't know that. And, um, and to recognize that being just to other human beings is super important and that you're liable to do injustices to people when you assume you know things that you really don't know. Right. So there's right. this kind of Socratic move which um, both uh, that deepens our lives and uh, catapults us forward both personally and socially, I think. Um, that uh, you know that we think human beings have to confront. Mm. We could probably continue to talk about that. I want to move on to, I mean, why is higher education so great? Like, how how thankful should we be? Is this really, is it really good? Could it be much better? What do you think? So there's kind of a big crisis in higher ed right now, but part of the crisis is uh, its success, I think. And so just to put on what's really put on the <laughs> table, what's really great about it. Um, the type of education that you're getting at Assumption, mm. um, a tiny percentage of the population would have been able to get an education even remotely like this, say, a couple hundred years ago. And so the people who like to lament the decline of, say, liberal arts or higher education often focus on how it's kind of watered down. You probably don't know Greek or Latin. No. Um, you're not going <laughs> to, you know, when, when, <laughs> when my dad went to Georgetown, when my mom, mom went to St. Louis University in, in the mid-60s, they both took four courses in philosophy and four courses in theology. Oh my mom gosh. took in addition to that two lab science courses plus like two years of language. I mean, it was, um, it was a more sh strenuous curriculum and things like right. that. So there are ways in which people who want to say, oh, there's been some kind of decline in the quality okay. of our education. It's not like they can't marshal evidence. On the other hand, I just kind of want to push back a little bit and say, the sheer number of people and the kinds of people who now have access to really a, a genuinely humane, liberating education is much higher than it's ever been in history. Right, okay. And we need to start with just sheer gratitude for that. Right. That's that's fair. I think that's, when I wrote that question, I knew that there's something that's has aged very well. And over the years, it seems like it's much more available. Um, you hear a lot about a lot of students being first generation students now, which is impressive and, and great. Um, you mentioned, you know, the liberal arts education at Assumption. What what should student students think is the end game of this education? Um, yeah. Well, part of the problem is, is that it, it, there isn't just one end game. I mean, unless I just say something like a life well lived, 
Right. You know, like human adulthood, lived well. Um, that's a complicated thing, right? So if we're just aiming for one thing, like, you know, we want to make you um, really good accountants or really good, I don't know, fill in the blank, nurse, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's a much simpler task. And uh, it's something that's much easier to explain and sell to people. It's much easier to execute as well. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's not as rich. Right. And um, so we're, we're trying to do something very complicated. And also there's this kind of like time release. You know how you like, there are certain versions of Tylenol or whatever you can buy that sure, have yeah, like yeah. this little release, you know, like at different right. hours of the day, delayed release capsules or something like that. There's something about liberal education, unlike just professional training, right? right. Which is what a lot of students want to go to college for is just professional training. I mean, that's one of the bad parts about the opening up college to more and more people is that that means that they're often after something other than a liberal education. Yep. And that it, it kind of changes the focus from real liberal education to other things. Um, there's a cost there. But there is something that's like a, a time release capsule to the liberating part of the education. That is to say, like, you'll experience it, cer certain features of your education as an undergraduate, you will feel are liberating. Like, oh, I've never had thoughts like this before. Oh, I was wrong about this. Then you right. could get to think better thoughts and you get to reorder your life a little bit. What you'll find is that that process, if, you're, if you've gotten a decent undergraduate education, the liberal education tradition, that process will continue and five years from now, or 10 years from now, 20 years from now, for me, 25 years later, I can see ways in which that process that was started in me as an undergraduate continues to transform me right. and continues to liberate me. So it's not like the liberation happens all at once in those four years and you graduate and it's over. It's more like this continual process that started because um, if it works right, uh, you've acquired a habit of thought that allows you to continually kind of improve the way you think. Right, but I think I'll say that, I mean, I think you know this and you'll agree with me, but it takes, you know, embracing it. It takes some, it takes effort um, for students. I think there's a lot of students who don't embrace it. And then if they don't embrace it now, then they might not, I think it could help them later in life. They might think back to something they learned or something they read, but I mean, what if they don't then kind of all of it is, is for not, right? For some students, I mean, I guess being a teacher, being a parent, being a dog owner, um, I've had to learn to let go of a lot of things. Like, you can't force a student to learn. You right. just cannot force it. Yeah. Um, there are all kinds of things, like you have this other living thing in front of you, a student, a child, a dog, you cannot force always what, what you want out of it. Um, you have to try to coax things out of them. Right. And um, that one of the things that means is that you have to come to terms with, they're not gonna reach everybody and you're not responsible for that. Like teaching isn't, um, it doesn't work like a, like a chemical reaction or something like that. It, it actually is like that person needs to want certain things. They need to make certain decisions, and you cannot do that for them. Hmm. So in a certain number of students, it won't pay off. And i like, yeah, that's part of human freedom is that I can't force it to pay off. Right. And I respect their freedom, and it's precisely why they deserve liberal educations because they are free beings, but it also means that they can either pick it up or not. Right. I will say that for the most part, I think it has long-term consequences that end up being deeper than the person at the time recognizes. Okay. As a, as a professor, and you obviously deal with this problem, and you try to engage your students in those, fr those freshmen that come in and take the required courses who may be science majors or business majors, what is the most, is patience the most important thing, or is it um, kind of relating to them? What, what, as a professor, is the most important thing to springboard that engagement, that love for... Um, themselves phone screen. Um, I guess what I would say is that you have to start by showing the students that things that they already care about um, connect to what the class is on in, right. in the specific way that they they actually are more likely to get the things they already want at least deep down yep. 
if they start asking these other kinds of questions and considering these other kinds of points of view. Right. And because it turns out like they have these kind of surface desires, I think, and they think, well, I think right now I want a cheeseburger and, or I want to be an accountant or something like that, right? Whatever it is, that's like, that's, that's my kind of surface desire. And it turns out, I think, that we actually have really, as human beings, deep longings yeah. for things that we often don't even recognize that what I'm really longing for is a type of recognition from other human beings. And I'm looking for a certain kind of life full of activities that are intrinsically feel meaningful. Uh -huh. And um, I want to, uh, fundamentally, I want the truth. Like if I could have a pleasant life for 80 years, but it turns out that I'm living something like the Truman Show and none of my friends are real friends and none of my relationships are real relationships and what I think is the sun is not the sun, I, I would not be satisfied with that. So it turns out that I have these deep desires that I don't even know I have until I start doing philosophy. Right. And then the question is how are those superficial desires like the cheeseburger or to become a nurse or an accountant or something, how are those related to those deeper desires? Because really it's the deep ones that we care about and you'll give up one of the surface ones as soon as you really believe that it's inconsistent with one of the deep ones. Right, because it's not to say don't pursue the job mm -hmm. with a good pay, but it's it's kind of how you prioritize the things in your life. Is that maybe fair? Or should I, you know, if I graduate from Assumption and say I become an accountant, my brother's just became an accountant, how would he continue to uh, kind of practice philosophy or, or practice thoughtfulness when it seems like he made it, he got, you know, he gets paid now. Like the, the college thing worked, it's done. Um, how would he kind of re, uh, bring up those ideas? Well, I think the first step is to realize that he's not actually going to be satisfied if all he does is make money. Mm -hmm. That money is a purely instrumental thing. And um, I mean, I'm totally for money. I like it. Yeah. Uh, but it's a purely <laughs> instrumental thing. And he will simply not be satisfied as the type of being he is if that's if he pretends like, oh, I've won, I game over, you know, like I've completed my task right. just because he makes a boatload of money eventually. And that's because the type of being he is is a being that's built with longings for things that are deeper than that, um, built specifically with a capacity for, for meaning, for grasping meaning, for making meaning, um, for expressing meaning, for recognizing truth and falsehood and uh, having insights and uh, engaging meaningfully with other human beings. He has those capacities and he's just not going to be a, you know, a happy, fulfilled human being unless he exercises those capacities. Right. Now, some people do make that mistake and they just kind of think, well, I just need to make more money. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think anyone deep down is satisfied right. by that. Right. You speak with a certainty that even though you don't know my brother, he has the capacity, or he has the, the need for something besides money. So you do think that in, in our human nature, um, we have the capacity for meaning, and, and the, the, you know, meaning, I know it's a broad sense, but that is kind of the end goal. So meaning is the end goal of liberal arts education. I might say meaningfulness or something like that, rather than meaning. Uh, it, okay. We want to develop your capacity, um, I would say, for authentic meaningfulness. Where, where obviously something like something that's true is more meaningful than something that's false. Mm -hmm. Something that's good is more meaningful. An activity that's good is more meaningful for an, than an activity which you thought was good but turns out to have been a huge mistake. Right. Right. So we want to increase your capacity for that. But I mean, that's the kind of the education. Uh, that's part of the education. But the liberating part of liberal education is that that requires that you um, loosen your commitments to things that might that you think in advance are going to fulfill you or be true or be good or be meaningful when really they won't. And so you've got to mm -hmm. kind of liberate yourself from all kinds of assumptions right. or um, in order to actually get something more meaningful. I think that's why I was attracted to philosophy because it's it's, a, it's like an anxious feeling when, you're, when your uh, ideas are tested and then when they turn out to be terrible. <laughs> and um, But if you overcome that, then you have this potential for for meaning um is this gonna is liberal arts education going away are we are you worried about that in 20 years is it gonna i'm sure it won't be the same but is it is it gonna go away i mean they just changed the core like what do you think about that or i guess they didn't change it yet they are changing it they are uh, changing it though. yeah and i think it's a good core uh, the new one is not so different than the current one it's probably stronger right. in some ways weaker in others probably more um 
practical right now for what students need, partly because a lot of majors have a whole lot of requirements and so students are really being pressed right. to fit in their 40 courses. Um, I don't think liberal arts education is going away because the human need for it isn't going away. Okay. I will say about the history of liberal arts that there's a constant sense that we're recovering something that is wicked old and that has almost been lost. And you know, so the Romans think they're recovering something Greek and then the medievals, not without reason, after the Dark Ages think they're recovering something Roman. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Renaissance humanists think those medievals are stupid. We're going to go recover something Roman. And this kind oh, of yeah. keeps happening. And so the feeling that there's some kind of relic here, which is very fragile and delicate, that's a permanent feeling for people in the liberal arts in the last 2,000 years. Right. And it's that, not new yeah. to us. Right. And we, it's, is it, it's more continuing than recovering, right? Because then the Romans adjusted mm -hmm. the views of the Greeks and they made it better maybe or worse. Um, worse. Worse. Well, I don't know. I, that, that's unfair of me. Is, um, so, Okay. No, but there's a, there is a kind of uh, continuity, which is a, also a kind of constant a, a change. And um, so for me, it's not going away. I do think it's been changed in some ways for the better. Like I said, it's more available now for many more people and many more kinds of people than would have been available for before. I wouldn't have gotten the education I got um, 50 years ago, let alone a couple hundred. Right. Um, uh, but at the same time, the liberalness of it is threatened because people, I think, um, they think they can take care of meaning and truth and living a good life all on their own. Right. And what they can't take care of on their own is becoming a nurse or an accountant. So just please teach me that and then I'll go away. Hmm. Um, and I, I think that, the, it, you know, if we have a culture that's more transactional and a culture that's more based on information than wisdom, um, because information is everywhere with the internet. It's, a, it's just absolutely outrageous the amount of information that's available now compared to even like when my childhood before the internet was a big thing. Right. So we have information everywhere but not wisdom. The culture is very transactional and um, people want results and outcomes. And none of those things are easy. It, it, in a culture that prioritizes those, it's not easy to explain the value of liberal education. Mm and how it actually will augment all the other goods that you want out of life. And so there's a, there's a risk there. You think that risk is created because of maybe technological advancements? Um, I, I think one of the risks is from that. Do you use ChatGPT? I fooled around with it to see how it works. Um, right. Don't use it. There's no reason for me to yeah, use it. Yeah, there's not really. Um, well, how could I think students can use it though? I think it can help students organize themselves. I think it can help them organize assignments. Mm -hmm. um, except, assuming they don't plagiarize, then I think it's a good tool. I think many, I think many students might use it to plagiarize. Um, I think that professors are cracking down on it. Are they? Well, we held a discussion about it uh, about a month ago in the teaching center here. And I don't know to what extent students are using it already. That's hard for me to tell. So maybe you should tell me that. <laughs> um, there are tools yeah, to uh, test it. So if you think a paper is using uh, one of these algorithmic writing programs, you can test it right. with really high certainty, you know, high probability anyway. Um, see whether it's been yeah. written by a bot. Um, That's right. But again, like you don't, you know, a bot can't make friends for you. That's right. A bot can't raise your children. A bot can't be married for you. Those are all activities because they're meaningful. You need to do yourself. Right, and it can't intellectually teach you. It, right. You know, if you if you use your if you use ChatGPT to write a paper, it might feel good after you hand it in, but then you didn't learn anything. Um, so, yeah, I I do think that the the I think people are getting a little too worried. I think they're overestimating the technology. I could be wrong. I think in five years it'll be similar. Um, except people will make much more money off it. There's, I get ads and it's like, are you using your papers to write ChatGPT? Well, your professors can know that, so use this software to reword that. It's like, okay, cool. So let's just find other ways around it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to me how much students, some students, not all students, how much they work to avoid learning. Which is like yeah, not their yeah. supposed to be their goal. Spencer and I talk about that all the time. But it's also the case that this isn't the first generation of students that has tried to avoid learning. I of mean, course, um, I've done it. I've done it. I did it all of high school every year. 
I think it's maybe a maturity thing. It's like, oh, I can actually, if I just don't avoid the learning and do it, then I'll be better for it. It's almost selfish, but if you accept it, it's good selfishness. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I think, I mean, I think the key, the key thing that people need to realize is that um, you, you can't uh, outsource the meaningfulness of your own life. And if what education is doing is allowing you to understand meanings better, to make better meanings, to therefore live a more meaningful life in all kinds of ways, have more meaningful activities, it just is nonsense to try to outsource this. Right. Right. Um, I can understand why in the, you know, panic of a last minute paper assignment, students would give in to that temptation, but. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think if it, you know, I don't know if a student should get a zero on a paper they plagiarize. I think they should, I think if they demonstrate that they knew it was wrong and that they explain why and they understand that the why was, is still bad, I think they should have another chance at maybe the maximum grade 75%. What do you think about that? I just, I mean, I don't know. I just thought about that. I think it really depends on circumstance, the type of cheating, right, what the policy right. in the class is. Right. I think different teachers need different policies and different assignments, different types of cheating need different responses. I think there should be a jury, and each plagiarism instance goes to the jury of students. Of students. <laughs> okay, st mm -hmm. students, five students, uh, three professors. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, <laughs> no, but I don't know. That's interesting, plagiarism. Because, um, you know, you're not a bad person if you plagiarize. It's not being a bad person. It's about whether you earn the grade. <laughs> right, 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 right. Actually, yeah, I take, <laughs> I take it back. Um, what do you, this, you're going to probably not like this question at all. What is the greatest threat to American society today? And then I'll tell you what I think it is. I don't know. I mean, there are always problems, and there's never just one. Um, right. These questions are just to yeah. springboard into other discussion. I, and this is where I'm going to bring up the revolt of the masses. I think uh, this is a book I'm reading right now in Professor Stoner's class. Um, I don't know where the page is. I wrote, uh, so he says, so he starts by describing how there's the mass and there's the minority. and But he doesn't talk about um, minority, how, how we think of it, either religious minorities or um, ethnic minorities. He says that the minority are individuals who's, that strive for greatness and well, and the mass are seemingly, he says, that they're like the average crowd. And this quote says, <clears throat> For there is no doubt that the most radical division that, is po that it is possible to make humanity is that which splits it into two classes of creatures, those who make great demands of themselves, piling up difficulties and duties, and those who demand nothing special of themselves, but for whom to live is to be every moment what they already are, without imposing on themselves any effort towards perfection, mere buoys that float on the waves. And... I think my, my point here, I think there's a few things we could talk about here, but I mean, this is cool because I read this in class and it's, for me, it's motivational because I want to take on difficulties and duties. And I think by doing that, it'll make me a better person. It might make me part of the minority. Um, and then another problem is it, it seems like what Professor Stoner kind of explained is that he's alluding to hyper-democracy and that that and that this mediocre crowd crushes beneath it the minority of individuals who, you know, have unique thoughts, strive for perfection and greatness. What do you think about uh, those ideas? Well, they're interesting. I've never read the book. It's uh, an important book that I've never read. I'm happy about that. <laughs> so I should admit that up front. I have a chapter up of, on there you. There are lots of great books that I've never read. Um, right. I'm very grateful for the ones I have read. Um, I guess my first thought is... Uh, of Aristotle. Aristotle says that, you know, there are all kinds of divisions in the city, in the, you know, the country, and yeah. um, right. between the rich and the poor, and, for example, is the most powerful one um, politically. But he says the greatest division is actually between the virtuous and the non-virtuous. That's actually the deepest and most significant distinction. But that there are actually so few virtuous people that they could never actually organize themselves to run mm. a government. Right. There are just too few of them. Um, like the preeminent virtuous one that he talks about? The, well, no, it's just the there's, people who are authentically virtuous. Okay, and there's just uh, such a small minority yeah. of those people. So it's not, it's, they can't possibly be the right 
you think, well, just take the good people and put them in charge. And the answer is there are too few of them. Right. It's not just that they wouldn't get support from the masses. It's that yeah. there are actually too few of them to do all the work. And we need, yeah, right? exactly. We need the work um, requires a ton of people. So, I mean, okay. so this kind of thought seems to be in that tradition. But a little bit of a skeptic in me, I kind of want to say uh, we all want to think of ourselves as part of this virtuous minority, the few people who are actually really trying. And um, right. I know some people aren't trying. I know a few who don't seem to be trying, who mm -hmm. are just happy being their terrible selves and are self-righteous about it. Um, I see that all the time. But at the same time, I think I think a lot of people maybe not aren't, aren't part of either of those groups, but really genuinely try often um, without either just being buoys on the water or being 24-7 uh, battling for higher virtue. Right, but I think that the majority try hard, but they try with this cap, this ceiling, that because of everyone else, I can't actually be greater than the ceiling that they're making for themselves, which is not real. That's why I like this quote, because it shows you that, um, I'm getting another call. It shows you that, um, you know, this, every, everyone can possibly be great, and I think that's real. I think that's true, and I think that in the past, I didn't think that I could be great, even though my dad would always tell me, you can do whatever you want, you can be whatever you want. I thought that was something dads just told their sons, they just had to do that. Mm -hmm. But I guess I wish maybe a few years ago I took that to heart, um, because I think now I'm, I'm doing that, I'm taking that to heart. I'm not, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm being great, but every morning I wake up and I think I can be, you know, much more than I am. Well, I guess what I would say is that I, um, this is one of the this is one of the great things about the bourgeois age that we're living in. Uh, that is, um, there's a economic historian named Deirdre McCloskey who's written all these books on the the bourgeois age, mm. and um, it's an age that's dominated by the dignity of uh, common people and the virtues of um, thrift and work and honesty. And it's very different than uh, an age that's dominated by a, by a sense of aristocratic nobility, which can be often brutal and push people down. Mm. Um, and so when you say that everyone can be great, I mean, that's not plausible if what you mean by that is some kind of aristocratic greatness, which really hinges on the majority of people stinking, right? right? Um, I, I'm kind of counting on them. Right? Yeah. Because then that's, that's the contrast that makes you great. Yeah. So the, yeah. the bourgeois conception is more like, actually, I can be great just by working hard and paying my bills and raising my kids and being really good to my wife. Yeah. And um, there's a certain kind of greatness in that. And that's within sure, my reach. Sure. And sure. I, I deny the claim that um, the old uh, aristocratic sense of greatness is greater than that. So there's a kind of, there's something in the bourgeois age that allows you to say that. And I think the risk of that, what I mean, which is I, which I really quite agree with, and I'm grateful for. I think a lot of the great things of our era come out of this sensibility. Um, but at the same time, you don't want that to smother very uh, special forms of greatness that not mm -hmm. everyone. I mean, it's not true that everyone can be great the way that list them. You know, right. I would say. Um, I don't know. Einstein is great in a very special way, yeah. or like I think Frederick Douglass is the best American. Huh. And it's not true that just like anyone can do that, you know. Right. right. Um, I mean, I could list other people too. Not everyone has the greatness of Washington, and all those people have flaws, pretty serious ones, you know. Um, but they also have something outrageously great, which is not just bourgeois virtue. And I kind of want to both say with you, you can be great, and there's a kind of special greatness to some people. Right, that we might not notice right away or off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree with that. I think we're in agreement about that. Um, uh, let's move on to some other, uh, one more question about this. What, what would you say is more important, gr a group identity, having a group identity or having an individualistic mind? Uh, those are my two options. <laughs> in, okay, okay. Um, would you rather have group identity or... <laughs> I don't want either. It seems to me like it's. I'd like to be a person in a community. It's group identity. No, I don't think so. Because in a community, there's all kinds of difference, and it's not the case that we all have to, you know, define ourselves, especially as opposed to other group identities. Right. Um, 
and uh, there's a fullness of persons in a okay. community that isn't recognized in, you know, like I'm group identity, short people, you know, right. So or whatever you, so you know, brown haired people. One is not more important than the other, but they're both important. Like they're both kind of required for a good life, is what it seems. The the, the class I'm taking about this book mm -hmm. is called Individual and Community, so we're kind of working with that. Maybe it's and it, it's individual and community for a reason, not individual or mm -hmm. community. So you make a good point, <laughs> of course. Uh, and yeah, I, this kind of relates back to the fact that the liberal arts education is good. Um, and I got something from the text that I was looking for that wasn't exactly what he's saying, but in my life, I, th I found it to work. And it might not even be right. I might be wrong, but I think I'm using it in a good way. Um, and I think that's, that's why liberal Or more likely, you're probably partially right. You know, that's probably that's right. usually where we okay, are. Okay, there we yeah. go. I like that better than being completely wrong. Um, I want to ask just like some random questions, and then we'll we'll wrap it up. Uh, Spence, Spencer and I talked about last episode. Um, we talked about how, or yeah, it was last episode. We talked about anxiety and depression growing up, and how in high school that's a weird thing. Uh, we talked about some dangers that high school might provide that makes that worse. In you know any time of, of your life when you have felt stressed, anxious, depressed, what helped you in combating that? Cigarettes. <laughs> That's the number one thing. Okay. Yeah. So we should I should start smoking cigarettes or? No, I mean I wouldn't suggest that. Um, cigarettes. Interesting. Uh, running. Sometimes I went a year sprinting every day. Sprinting, sprinting. Um, Were you like intervals reading? or was it? Yeah, sprint intervals for half an hour. It was oh. pretty intense. Um, every day, and uh, got in great shape. Nice. Um, but I was smoking also at the same time. Not yeah. while I was running, but during oh, yeah. like, the same days. <laughs> during the breaks and the intervals. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Um, <laughs> and philosophy helps, you know, because then right. I read something and I kind of forget whatever it is that's bothering me. So, uh -huh. you know, Freud says something. Um, I really like the, I mean, it's not that I agree with all of it. I am not a Freudian at all, but um, yeah. he's super smart. And... Um, in Civilization is Discontents, he says, look, there are three things that people use to cope with how, you know, reality isn't what they want it to be. Right. And those things are, are intoxications, yep. uh, substitutions, and deflections. Right. And, um, and he tries to emphasize, like, these aren't bad. We actually need them to survive. And, um, but obviously some of them can be done badly, you know, right. so if I... All of them may be, right? Yeah. Um, so if you ask me factually, how, how did you get through that those couple of years? It's like yeah. cigarettes running, reading. Right. Um, on the other hand, I would say, you know, there's a, I'm not in AA, but I'm a fan of AA and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Right. And one of the things I've learned from my, a couple friends in AA um, is that, you know, like, it's not right to think of alcohol as your problem. Yeah. It's that alcohol is the way you're trying to deal with a different problem. That's right. And it's a, it's a way to deal with that different problem that actually creates its own problems while also not really dealing with the other problem. And so, um, you know, cigarettes are like that, deflections and substitutions. Freud lists those as coping mechanisms, but they're all essentially ways to cope with something that you can't otherwise address at all. So the best right. thing is actually just face reality mm -hmm. and try to deal with reality as it is. Um, and use maybe what coping mechanisms you found that help you. Just don't get, don't drown in them, obviously. We'll um, moderate them. But also then, I mean, the best situation is that, you know, I've quit smoking and it, it's partly because I, I've learned to cope with reality in a way that's healthier. Right. So you have to be prepared to, uh, you can't just accept that's your reality for the rest of your life, maybe, right? That this is a coping, this is a coping mechanism that is helping me, but if I don't um, quit smoking, for example, then maybe I'm still just using it as a deflection. Um, yeah. Because th I'm actually, I'm pretty pro-marijuana. Uh, I think that marijuana can be helpful for people, but I think that the, a danger lies in the fact that they'll um, just they'll get the most they can out of marijuana, but then they'll just continue to smoke or ingest marijuana, and then they already got what they could have gotten from it that was good. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, yeah, it's really hard to put limits on right. those coping mechanisms, right. and and so they become their pro the problems of, in their in themselves, you know, and um, 
Yeah, so I mean, the short answer is cigarettes and running and reading, but the long answer is uh, learning to look at reality more honestly, okay. and then to respond as much as you can with whatever's in your power to make that reality better to the extent that it can be made better, and that your power there is limited. Hmm. But So that's like the deep answer. That's actually what, what we need to do. But you can't just tell someone that. They have to go through that process and figure that out. Yeah, unfortunately. Interesting. That's okay. Yeah. No, that's good. That's, I think that's, that's very insightful. Um, these two questions kind of link together that I wrote down. Should you... I'm sure we can talk about a more specific question, but should you help everyone who you think needs it? What if sometimes I'm like, oh, I need to tell them that this is wrong. But then I'm like, is it wrong? Do I have the right to say it's wrong? You're not Batman. Okay. You can't just go around okay. solving everything. The first thing I'd say to that is it's actually really hard to help people. Right. Okay. That's because they're free and they have their own ideas and their own desires and their own traditions and their own contexts. And, um, kind of easy to help them in superficial ways it's really hard to help them in any deep way and you can tell them you see something and they don't know it and you can tell them and ha half the time they won't even believe you when you say it and they'll have to discover right. it like 10 or 20 years later like you know he was right yeah. and so that might help but it might help in the long run or it might not help at all because they might have a kind of backlash against you so it's like no you should not try to help everyone that you think you can help because in fact you can't help as many people as you think you can right. because you're not Batman yeah okay. um, but at the same time of course, you need to help people yeah. when you can help them. I mean, so right, what, that's the whole point of this. You have to like learn to discern where your you, your intervention could actually be helpful. Okay. And when your intervention is just kind of an act of self-importance. Right, right, and that's a line. That's a okay. And it's hard, especially for young people, to see that line because it's really easy to look at the world and see all the bad things and to think this should be easy to fix. I know the answers. I right. can fix this. Like at 20, I thought I, if everyone just listened to me, this problem would be gone. <laughs> right. And um, that's just a very normal thing for young adults to think. Mm -hmm. And it just turns out, I think, that a lot of problems are really much more complicated. And that does not an excuse not to help, but it, it does complicate our attempts to help. And it sh we should be really humble in the idea that it's all that easy to fix right. things. Sometimes be Batman. No, never be Batman. Never be Batman? No. Okay, well, ruin, just ruin my dreams. That's all right. Who, how do you connect with students um, as a professor? I don't know. I talk to them. Just treat them like adults? Well, that's one of the things I do, which is weird because I have a 16-year-old at home now, so increasingly I'm seeing the connection between children and my students. And so I'm oh. – but I, I, I've always <laughs> – my students, our college students, I've always just thought they're young adults. I'm going to talk to them like they're adults, right. talk to them like they're peers. And um, so that's, and I am just try to be very honest with them. Mm -hmm. I try to um, make whatever I'm teaching really compelling, you know, just yeah. so that they can see. I don't teach anything that's stupid, but I also teach a lot of things that I disagree with here and there. Yep. And um, I want them to... You know, if I can really get behind teaching Descartes while I'm teaching Descartes, even though I don't agree with Descartes on pretty yeah. much anything, that helps them engage, you know? Interesting. And um, I also tell a lot of personal anecdotes, as you've, you've seen yeah, in my yeah. class, you know? <laughs> and I think that for, I don't know why that works, but it seems to work for me. It worked? Yeah, no, because it's, it's like real. It's, I think it comes off as real and that you care and that you're involved. Um, let's, I'll ask my last question, and then we'll wrap up. I think this is... An impossible question, but what's more important, trusting your feelings or trusting your reason? And if it, the, the better way is not, what's more important? Um, is it just situational, or do you always have to trust both? Do you have to take both into an account? Okay, so every decision. You asked earlier what is the biggest threat to society today, and right. I think it's not trusting in reason. Hmm. Um, but having said that, I think there's a kind of false dichotomy going on here because feelings are not um, the very, it's not like reason and feelings are opposites or something like that. Right. And I think, I think reason needs to be in charge over feelings, but it can't act like a despot over feelings. Feelings are themselves infused with reason. Like think about the things you call feelings. You're not just talking about like, you know, warmth, you know, when you put your hands under the 
sink water or something like that. Yeah. Um, you're usually talking about emotions. That's right. And emotions all have this kind of what we call cognitive content. That is to say, like, why are you, why do you feel this way? And then you have to say it. It's like, well, it turns out that I like her, but she's paying a lot of attention to him. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden what's happening is you feel jealousy, right? But to explain your feeling, you actually have to explain certain things. Namely, I like her mm -hmm. and she seems to like him. Right. Two facts in the world and and your feeling is a response to those facts. It's not the case that it's just a totally irrational thing that's happening, completely empty of thoughts. There are thoughts built into your emotions. And so what we want to do is recognize that emotions are all, I guess I would say, linked up somehow with thoughtfulness or reason, mm -hmm. uh, that they have a kind of cognitive content that reason can learn things from the feelings like you will notice things because your feelings will force you to notice something that your reason might want to ignore right and what's reasonable to do in that situation is to use your feelings as kind of data okay. input like why is it that i feel this way let right. me think about this what is it about mm. the world was it about me that's going on here and so reason to be in charge well it can't view itself as the opposite of the feelings instead we have to view feelings as subordinate to but also infused with right so not necessarily reason. less important just very different very different and okay because i i do i do see people make i think all my but i do think a lot of my bad decisions i i take my feelings into account and i act on them mm -hmm. and i don't think it's that i don't use reason i just use bad reason yeah maybe the if i'm doing that if that's true is it bad reason or is it my feelings just taking over my prefrontal cortex? Like all my decisions just coming out of uh, anger or lust or? Well, it's definitely true that we can um, BS ourselves about whether we're being reasonable because it's really convenient for us to believe that what we want is the right thing. Right. Um, and so that happens. Right. Um, but it, you described it very well, but neither of those, the fact that this can happen is no reason to give up on reason as some kind of um, authority that should help us pay attention to our feelings, gather information from them, um, not put them in charge, but also not govern them despotically, I guess is the way I would put okay. it. And despotically you mean like tyrannically? Or by, yeah, okay. I mean that reason can't be in charge in such a way that it doesn't respect that the feelings have a contribution to make. Right. Um, that you're a human, you have feelings. You can't. You shouldn't just ignore them. And on top of that, that sometimes they have a certain kind of message. Truth. That is. Maybe too. Yeah. That right. there there's certain kinds of content in them, which will help you see things in yourself and see things in the world, allow you to understand the world better, allow you to understand yourself better, and then you can actually act in the world better. Right. So it's like reason can't live well if it treats the feelings like they're evil or something like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. so I, I, I guess I would want to kind of fight the dichotomy. I would not. Want, I would want to say choose reason over the emotions, right, but right. also resist the dichotomy. Okay, okay, good, good. Well, that's all I have for you. Um, I think you provided a bunch of insightful information, so thank you, uh, Professor McGrath. Um, thank you for having me. It was fun. Right. Thank you.